Good morning. My name is Paul, and I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. We're continuing our series called Revival. And if you haven't been with us for the last few weeks, you can catch up online and catch those services. But I can bring you up to speed real quickly. We talked about a few weeks ago that revival, which is a movement of God, it is a supernatural divine movement of God where he moves in such a way like nothing we have ever seen before, that a revival and a movement of God begins in me. It's not something that happens externally to those outside, but it's something that God begins to stir and move in my heart, and that when it begins to move in my heart, then it will impact and influence those around me and those beyond me. But as that revival happens, we talked last week about two important things, is that revival causes me to repent. And repentance is a word that means that I'm going to turn away from my old life, my old actions, my old behaviors, my old lifestyles, my old choices, the things that were draining me, the things that were breaking me, the things that were causing me to need a savior, and that I'm going to repent, I'm going to turn away, and then I'm going to walk in the path of obedience to God's word and God's standards. I'm going to walk in grace and forgiveness and humility. I'm going to walk towards the best that God has for me. And I'm going to live that out. And then we talked about that second part was baptism, is that baptism was going public and just letting the world know, I'm not ashamed that Jesus is changing my life. And I'm going to let the world know. I'm going to let the world know so that they can help me. I'm going to let my friends and family know so that that they can walk alongside of me and so that they too can see what God is doing in me. And, And while I'm not perfect, I'm not going to walk alone any longer. I'm going to be surrounded by men and women, brothers and sisters of faith. And that's what I'm going to do when I go public with that. And, and this morning, we're going to just continue about this revival. We've been looking in the book of Acts, because Acts is where the Holy Spirit of God descended upon the disciples in this Acts chapter 2 experience called Pentecost. And we've just been walking through it over the last few weeks, and we're going to continue to do that. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42? And if you go ahead and pull out your message guide, the words are going to be printed there for those Bible verses. They're also going to be up on the screens. we got a stack of Bibles in the back. That's our gift to you today if you don't have one. But in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, we pick up the story and it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now the they here in that passage, the they is the men and women who accepted Christ. And when the spirit of the holy God descended there in the upper room and it filled the disciples and they went outside and they began to preach, it said 3,000 people. 3,000 people got saved that day. And so those 3,000, that's this they that they're talking about, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold their property and their possessions and they gave to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in their temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And in these few simple verses, what we find is the organic birth of the church. And here we are thousands of years later, tens of thousands of miles removed from where this took place, but we are continuing on in that which they ushered in, the church, and we see kind of a portrait for what church and an experience of the movement of God is supposed to look like. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning is just out of this passage, what are some of the marks of revival? What are some of the things that we could say, man, if God is genuinely moving like he did, we would see these things beginning to take place in our life, in our community of faith. And these are also some things to encourage us and to spur us on saying, that's what I need to do next as God is doing this great revival in me. So let's just go in the first verse. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. I love this. It says they devoted themselves. In other words, they made the choice that they were going to grow in their faith. See, the first mark revival is that there is a commitment to growth. 
that they're not going to let somebody else or they're not waiting on somebody else. Listen, they're going to take ownership of their own spiritual growth. And here at Crosspoint, we talk about that all the time, right? About spending time with God in prayer, in Bible study. We, we've made some things available to you. We let you know about some apps and some devotionals, some online Bible studies, some things that you can do to just grow on your own. Memorizing scripture, beginning to hide God's word in your heart. That see, when God's Holy Spirit begins to move in somebody's life or in a group of believers and he begins to move in a community of faith, there is a commitment by the individuals that they want to grow more. They want to know this God who saved them. They want to know his heart and they want to know the things that he desires, the things that he's got in store for them. They want to know what pleases him. They want to know him and spend time with him. That there's this commitment to growth in revival. But the scriptures go on and it says this. and says, and everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were performed. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. This is not like one of the main points, but it's a side point. I just love this. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. When's the last time you saw a bunch of Christians who agreed on anything? Right? I mean, in church work, we have this old joke that we say, you get two Christians, you got three opinions, right? Like, like man, we, sometimes we are some of the most like, opinionated and like, like divided people on the planet, and yet, you know, the mark of the movement of the Holy Spirit of God is that there is unity amongst the followers of Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to agree 100% on everything. Listen, I don't agree with myself on everything all the time, but it means that we're going to focus on what we do agree on. It means that we're going to work together on what matters most, and we're not going to let division and pettiness get in the way of a great work of God. It means we're going to fight to work things out as a family of faith, and we're not going to be divided, and we're not going to destroy each other or tear one another down. In fact, you know, that's probably one of the biggest complaints that the world and lost people have about the church is how we attack and how we divide and how we destroy one another. Listen, church should be the place with the most grace, the most compassion, and the most unity, right? It says that they were all together and had everything in common. But now we're going to get to the second point, right? Revival is marked by this. It says they sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. You know, one of the marks of Revival is just radical generosity. Nobody had to tell them to start helping one another. Man, it just was the outflow of God beginning to work in their lives that they wanted to help one another. They wanted to take care of one another. And it says that they sold their property possessions to give to anyone that had need. Do you realize these people didn't even know one another? They just started on this thing called the church. And they were so in worship and so growing and so moved by the Holy Spirit that they began to not just say, what's in this for me? But they said, how can what I have help you? You know, that's one of the marks of a church that's on fire for God is that there's radical generosity. That as a people and as a community, we don't hold on to things with closed fists and say, no, God, this is mine. It's all for me. It's that we go, God, this is all for you. Whatever I have is a gift from you. My time here on earth, my talents and my abilities, my treasure, my finances, all that I have, God, use it to build your kingdom. Give me eyes to see the needs of those around me. Help me help others. Because when I was helpless, God, you helped me through Jesus. And God, when I was starving, you fed me through the kindness of strangers. See, that God wants to do a work in us that releases our clenched fists and opens our hands to radical generosity. It's not a question of how much can we give. It's a question of, God, how much do you want today? Because it's all yours. Whether that's my possessions or my money or my time or my talents or my abilities, God, I surrender all. Radical generosity. The scriptures go on. I love this. And it says, and every day they continued to meet together 
in the temple courts. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. You know what they were doing? They were going to church and they were worshiping, just like we're doing here today. Man, and I don't know about you, but man, isn't it awesome that we've got all these dedicated, amazing musicians that give their time and their talents. Listen, they got more talent in their pinky than I got on my whole body, right? And to see what God does, how he brings together all these different instruments, all these different people. Listen, there's like 30 or 40 different people that come together week after week that make up the teams and that serve together and that volunteer together, that spend hours and hours and hours so that we can come together and we can worship in a vibrant, live experience. And that's one of the things that's so important here is because that in revival is marked by God-glorifying worship, that it's a celebration. You know, that's why we do what we do and we do it the way we do it here at Crosspoint. I spent way too many Sundays in a church thinking I was at a funeral service instead of a celebration. We have the good news of Jesus. We should be alive and excited and celebrate that. That I shouldn't be worried about falling asleep because it's so boring. I should be on fire and being like, how can I stand still and contain myself? Because what God is doing, it's God glorifying worship. It is alive. It is vibrant. I know for some of you saying, but yeah, but you don't do the songs that I like. Or do you only do some of the songs that I like? Or the songs that you do, do you do at a volume I don't like? Listen, we love you. And we're glad you're here. And we don't do songs. Listen, there's songs we do that I don't like. And there'll be a day that comes at Crosspoint, we'll do all the music, and I don't like any of it. You know why? Because it's not about me. It's about being relevant to the culture that we're trying to reach because the church is one generation away from extinction. But here's what's never going to change. The message of Jesus Christ. The truth of scripture, his word stands firm and we will never alter, change that or do anything other than preach it boldly and passionately. But we will use whatever methodology we can to reach a generation that doesn't want anything to do with our God or our community of faith. Just think about it. More of your friends and family are not in church today than are in church today. Well, what will it take to reach them with the gospel? Whatever it takes we're willing to do. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we do it the way that we do it. And, and that's why we make earplugs available. Because we actually don't want to divide you. We want to unite you. And if you don't like the volume, just sit in the back. It's terrible in the back. But it's not about the volume or the song selection. It's about the spirit of the living God alive in us and celebrating that life change. And that's why, man, God honoring, glorifying worship is a mark of revival. Do you understand this truth? Let me break it down for you. Do you realize that these early believers went right back to the temple that was filled with the religious leaders who weeks before were crying out, crucify Jesus. And they were unashamed. They went right back to the place where Jesus was betrayed by others and told that he should die And they stood proudly and loudly worshipped the Savior of the world. God glorifying worship is a mark of revival. Listen to what it says. It continues on. And it said, every day they continued to meet in temple courts. And then they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Did you catch that? It says they broke bread. In other words, they hung out together. They did the Lord's Supper. They worshipped. They did Bible study. Where? In their homes. So not only did they go to the temple, not only did they go to church on the weekend, but during the week, they met in homes. See, that's why we do this thing here at Crosspoint called small groups. In a few weeks, small groups are going to kick off. And small groups is an opportunity for us as we grow large to grow small. For these rows that you see on Sunday to become circles during the week. For no longer just being a face in a large crowd, but being a face that is known and that can grow in a small crowd. To find encouragement and intimacy and accountability and help living out my faith. To do life together. 
And we're not doing anything radical or new. Listen, we're, we're just following the blueprint of the organic movement of God as he ushered in and created this thing called church. Right to the very beginnings of where it all started. What does it say? It's, man, they met in homes. Yeah, they went to the temple. They worshiped together corporately. But then they also met during the week in homes, in small settings where they could get to know one another and they could have more time together and they could walk with each other through some of their ups and their downs, where they could study God's word and they could ask questions and they could interact and they could pray for one another. (coughs) See, revival is marked by groups, small, connected, and committed. Then the last thing as we go on, it says this. They met together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. The Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. Listen, one of the last marks of revival is remarkable gains for the gospel. Remarkable gains. It said that added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. The whole purpose of the church is to preach the message that Jesus saves. Well, that's what we're here for, and that's what we've been doing as Crosspoint, that we've just kind of honestly and openly just said, y'all need Jesus. And not just to you, to the thousands outside these walls, that you all need Jesus. That he is the one who can change you. He is the one who loves you. He's the one who has forgiven you. He is the one who wants to transform your life. And we make no bones about it. In fact, we make it the first next step of all of our next steps. Every Sunday, we make sure we talk about salvation and our need for it and our great opportunity we have for it. That I don't have to be lost. I don't have to be broken. I don't have to wander anymore. I am saved and found and healed and changed and transformed through Jesus. I am born again. I am redeemed. Whatever terminology you want to use, it comes down to this. God loves you and has a plan for your life. And it starts with your confession of Jesus. And when God moves, we see that explode. At Crosspoint, we are about 100 people away from seeing the 5,000th person accept Christ through the ministry of this church. Isn't that awesome? And we'll probably break that threshold in February or March. Or we could break it today if you all just accept Jesus, right? But it's not just about numbers of people who accept Christ, but that's an evidence. The scripture said, listen, literally, he said, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved because that's the message of Jesus. That's the mission of the church. And we make no bones about it. That God loves you and wants to change and transform your life. And we want to give you that opportunity. And so the question this morning is, what are you waiting for? For some of you, you've been hearing this message for years. But you've been fighting and you've been resisting. For some of you, today may be the first day you've ever heard this message. God wants to save you. Because he loves you. Because you matter to him. Regardless of what you grew up thinking or other people telling you, that God created you on purpose. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. You are valued. You are loved. And you were worthy of his sacrifice. And that what he has in store for you is life, abundant, full, transformative life. And he is with you always. From this life into all eternity. Would you guys go ahead and pull out that connect card that my friend TJ talked about earlier? It's inside your program. Everybody pull it out. On the bottom of that connect card, you're going to see there's some next steps, and this is exactly what we've been talking about. The first one says this, I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. What are you waiting for? If you need Christ, confess him right where you are. Cry out, Jesus, I need you. I'm lost, I'm broken, I'm hurting. I got nothing else, God. 
I need you. God, I felt you from a young age calling me, but I've been resistant to give up control. But today, God, I want to surrender. I want to give you that opportunity. Here's what I'm asking. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody moving around. No distractions. If the Holy Spirit of the living God is calling you to salvation today, then you pray these words. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart this truth. As I pray it out loud, dear Jesus, here I am. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that you are the son of the living God sent to redeem me. You lived a sinless life and you died on the cross to pay for my sins, my mistakes, my shortcomings. You came to heal me and to forgive me. You came to set me free and to help me. You came for me, Jesus. And today I'm saying yes. Yes, I want you. Yes, I surrender. Yes. I'm coming home, Father. I'm coming home. I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe that with you in my life, the best is yet to come because it's a promise of your holy word. So here I am, Jesus, completely surrendered. And while I don't have it all figured out, I know you won't let me down, you won't let go, and you won't quit on me for the rest of my life and until I step into eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you go ahead and check off that next step? We'd love to celebrate with you, and we'd love to get some information, just help you take hold of your faith and all that God has in store for you. You'll see a second next step, and it says, I will blank. I will blank. And today, we just kind of talked about like five marks of revival. We talked about like taking ownership and growth of your own spiritual faith. We, we talked about this idea that God is calling us to radical generosity, we talked about that God wants glorious, God-honoring worship. We talked about the truth that God is at work in our lives and that maybe we need to start getting in a little bit smaller of a group and growing with some other people together. We talked about how the gospel is a gospel that transforms and changes and gains lives and souls and salvation and that maybe, maybe what you need to do is just share your faith. He said, well, Paul, I'm, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I don't know the right words. Then maybe just share an invitation. In fact, we'll make this deal with you. You invite him to church. We'll share the gospel with him. You get him to come sit with you. And with all the compassion and grace of God, we will share with them the good news of Jesus. Because that's the purpose of the church. It's to change lives. Just as your life and my life has been changed, I don't want to stop there. Man, Hernando County is exploding. Did you know we're about to have 190,000 residents living in Hernando County? Every number has a name, and every name has a story, and every story is better with Jesus. For such a time as this, let's be the church, an organic movement of God's Holy Spirit through ordinary people, seeing and doing and being a part of extraordinary things together. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and this time that we could worship you, that we could honor you, and that we could praise you together. Father, as we have come to this moment I pray that we would take some next steps. I pray that we would just be sincere in our faith and our journey with you. Now, God, I don't have it all figured out, but I know I'd rather go through life with you than without you. I know I'd rather be broken with Jesus than safe without Jesus. I'd rather walk through dark valleys with Jesus than stand on sunny days without you, God. 
I'm so grateful that you loved my whole heart through my worst times, my toughest times, my good times, my great times. God, you never left me. You never quit on me. And the Father, if you can save me and change me, you can save and change anybody. Regardless of where our story starts, by the name of Jesus, our story can end better. By the power of your Holy Spirit and our work, you can redeem, change, and transform any life. And Father, we are the testimony of that. Father, move. Move in us and through us. Speak. Father God, as we gather up our tithes and our offerings, we come to you and we give generously. God, we give with open hands. God, we give, Father, so that we can advance your work and your gospel and your kingdom, Father. I just pray, Father, that we would be radically generous. That, God, we would be overwhelmed and that we would just trust in you. And that we would stop trying to hold on to that which you're asking us to let go of. Whether that's our treasure, whether that's our time, whether that's our talents, whether that's our future or our careers. God, we live and we walk and we breathe because of your grace at work in our lives. May we stop holding back any part of our lives from you and your lordship. And Father God, as we just worship together in these next few moments, God, I just pray that we wouldn't be in a rush to leave here, but that, God, we would just hang out with our brothers and sisters of faith in God-glorifying worship together, that we would praise the name of Jesus with confidence, with passion, with outstretched arms and open hearts, that we would declare in a voice of unity, Jesus, our Savior, Jesus, our God, we are your people. And for such a time as this, we are the generation that will stand in the gap for this county, for this community, for this country and this world. God, move unhindered in us and through us forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.